It's the Locked On Flyers podcast for Wednesday, March 15th, your daily dose of Flyers news analysis and high quality content that uh, could not have predicted that Nick Steeler would have the goal of the year for the Flyers. Well, goal of the year for the Flyers, for sure. Um, Channeling his inner Connor McDavid. It was crazy. Yeah, we're going to talk about that game against Vegas, and we're going to get into the Flyers player evaluation process and your mailbag questions all on today's show. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here, as always, with Russ Cohen, who is on Twitter at Sportsology. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Lockdown Flyers. That is where we post about our episodes and Flyers news. You can also email the show at LockdownFlyers at Gmail to ask mailbag questions, some of which we are getting to today. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Locked On Flyers is free and available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you listen to podcasts. So subscribe to get all of our episodes here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Plus, we're over on YouTube, so subscribe there as well. Russ, we have uh, got a little bit of news to talk about before we dig into the Vegas game. Uh, There's a little bit of consternation about Sean Couturier right now because he skated at morning skate in a non-contact jersey. And, you know, it seems like from what he is saying that he's really itching to play. Obviously, he hasn't played all season. And so he just wants to get a couple of games in. Um, John Tortorella says, "Uh, I I probably should wait until next season, but he understands Katuri wanting to get in. And there's a certain benefit, right, to seeing where he's at in his rehab process at the moment. I don't know if the benefit is worth it. Like, we we saw what happened the last time he tried to ramp it up. And I just feel like get more time healing get more time strengthening, get more time for everything. I get it. You want to be in there. I think the closest, I think they're doing the right thing by letting him skate with his teammates and don't let it go any further. I just don't, I don't see any benefit in it. Yeah. I tend to agree with you there. I, I do think there is that benefit of knowing where he is now to help in terms of what he does this off season. But at, at the same time, I, I think that risk is too great. At the moment. So I I would keep him out as well. But, you know, we'll see what happens there. I mean, ultimately, the coach could keep him out like that. So I'm I'm not worried about that. Yeah. And then uh, the other thing was uh, Tyson Forster being back in the lineup with Wade Allison continuing to be hurt. And there is an issue there because of, you know, John Tortorella wanting him specifically because of the Flyers lack of scoring. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah, because of the shot. He has a great shot. Like, we get it, John. I understand he's got a great shot. Um, But now you're keeping him away probably could be up to three games from Lehigh because I think think Forrester is going to play, you know, against Buffalo, and I think he's going to play against Carolina. So, I don't know. Is, you know, is the benefit of helping the Flyers this much worth it for keeping him away from Lehigh, who need him a lot? Um, clearly John's going to win out. So, I mean, that's, I, I, I've said that from the beginning and that's, that's going to happen every time. So, you know, right now in the end, um, Forrester, you know, was, was good on the power play and got a couple shots on that. Is it helping his development a little bit? Um, would the playoff run help his development more? Yes, it would. And so that's the, that's the battle here. Yeah, and to me, I think it's most important that he play in the Phantoms games tonight and Friday, which are the ones against Hershey. We talked about it yesterday and how key that was in the Phantoms playoff run. So 
that's that's a big part of it for me in terms of keeping that momentum going for the Phantoms. Yeah, there's there's a feeling though that he's staying up for a few games. That's just the feeling. We don't know for sure. And you know, and 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 people were saying pregame. I don't know. It was just leaking out. You know, stuff does that. There was no way Allison was going to play against Vegas. So if they knew that that definitively, kind of makes me think that just you know, the Buffalo one is probably up in the air for Allison too. Yeah, we shall see. Uh, as far as the game itself against Vegas, I think this was, you know, a pretty indicative of how game of how this season has gone for the Flyers and what the issues yes. are, right? Because we had the lack of finish mm-hmm. and we had uh, special teams. Power as, play as bad. killer. Bad. Yeah. Penalty kill getting worse. It used to be pretty good. It's getting a little mm-hmm. worse. Uh, yeah, it's just the power play part is really the one that's going to, you know, it's inexplicable and it's going to stain the whole season as far as uh, how the coaching staff did. There was some resiliency, so that's good. Um, I think Jonathan Quick was a little bit of a help there too, that third goal. I mean, that's a goalie where the goalie knows exactly who has the puck and where it's going to go, and he has it with him. And for some reason, Quick went down early and he just took himself out of the play. He made it a lot yeah. easier to score. On Morgan and Frost. Yeah. On Morgan Frost, yeah. So that's the reason I don't think Quick will be their Stanley Cup goalie unless they have no choice. Like injuries just dictate that. But because um, right now they're kind of floating four goalies. But in the end, um, it was good for the Flyers to at least score more. And, you know, they were kind of holding Vegas in it. But I, I'm also going to point out something that's was disturbing to me and I tweeted about it. So Paul Cotter um, is a young player, you know, he's in the second season, part of a second season for, for Vegas. I, I knew him pre-draft and he was a guy that was kind of like needed to get in better shape, needed to be a better skater. He's done that. Right. And he made Travis Sandheim look ridiculous on, on mm-hmm. the play there where he, he got an assist. He got Sandheim to blow out his tires simply with a little edge work. And the one thing I was noticing, and this is really with the whole Flyers defense, lateral lateral movement. And, you know, I'll, I'll take Cam York out of it because he, he's really good. But even Provorov, lateral movement to try and keep up with the faster Vegas skaters, they couldn't do it. And so how many times in the game did it look like Vegas had a power play going? Yeah. The possession was a real interesting aspect to this game because there were periods of time where I thought, you know, Vegas was pretty dominant, but the Flyers did have their moments there. Sure. That's what the they resiliency yeah. aspect of it was. And that's why, again, this game just felt so familiar with oh, everything yeah. that happened with, um, you know, lack of pos- the second period was a disaster, I thought, yeah. from a possession standpoint. And then there was this comeback that didn't quite make it and yeah, yeah, yeah. Pulling, and then pulling I, the goalie with it not working. Yeah, we got to talk about had, that, too. That yeah. is another tremendous failure of this coaching staff because they don't even act like they have the too many guys. They have extra guys on the ice. the The issue is when they first started. I thought the, the lack of finish was the part that bit him there. I thought they did have possession for no, no. But remember the beginning of it. There were like four guys on the same side, yes, and then they, they lost. True. And they when they lost the puck, and I'm like, why are so many guys on the same side? How does that even happen? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a coaching problem when it, it comes to the, the holds uh, goalie for the extra attack. And the too many whatever. men on the ice, mm-hmm. it was detected more than once with the flyers. They let him get away with it. The refs let him get away with it a second time. The first time they couldn't let him get away with it because the puck was touched. Before right. It. But the second time they did it, they got away with it. And, and torts knew that. And he, he talked about with the too many men on the ice. So, Again, this coaching staff has to have some changes, too. Yeah, we have talked about that, and uh, it's something we'll be talking about a little bit on tomorrow's show as well. Uh, In the meantime, the Flyers have jumped up to the five spot in Tankathon at the moment because Montreal finally won a game. (laughs) But, um, you know, to be continued on that front, uh, And for us, we will be turning our attention 
to player evaluation for the team and the process that the Flyers should be undertaking right now to kind of kick off this rebuild in an effective way. And we'll be doing that coming up next. The midway point of the NBA season's here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drained. I might bet on Tyrese Maxey with the Sixers because Joel mm. and me gave him a talking to. Um, so don't. Plus, FanDuel lets you combine your bets for a chance of a bigger payout with a same-game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to learn more. All right, Russ. So, you know, continuing our discussion about what the future of the Flyers looks like, I think, you know, one of the big projects that the team has to start working on is, okay, we're doing a rebuild. It's not going to be immediate. Uh, Who of our current players fit the timeline that we have to really get us to the point of competitiveness and the, the ability to have a Stanley Cup run? And so... I I think that kind of that's the first step. You do that throughout the system. And so I think that obviously, you know, the first sort of decisions you have to make is the players that you have now on the main roster that you think you want to might trade in the off season because the peak of their timing doesn't fit and, or you just feel like they won't contribute to the process. I think, that's a separate part of it, right? That there are guys on the team that you could conceivably see helping the process along the way that are more veteran, but maybe may not make it to the mountaintop. (laughs) If you get what I mean. I do. Um, I don't know if they're going to have that luxury. I think uh, I could tell you what I would do. I'm not sure if they're going to do this, but I would get offers on everybody and then decide from within those offers who uh, makes the most sense to trade based on what's, value is out there and then who could help us in the future i'm going to have to assume that i may have to trade a player that i still think could help me in the future if he's the only one that's gonna get me value and get me out of cap trouble like that's where they don't have the luxury of picking and choosing because i think we learned one thing at the deadline and you know aside from travis connecty maybe because maybe he wasn't put out there there's not a lot of interest in a lot of their guys so I think you know one of the main things they have to do then is change how they value players, right? They have to at least look at the system and say, what are our players worth to us as part of our process? And then what are our players' values in the open market for real? Like, Yes. And, I mean, I'll tell you. Those some... could be two very different things. And then yes. kind of prioritize who you maybe want to trade over others, right? Right. So here's something I would do. And this this would take emotion out of it because you need to take emotion out of it with John Tortorella as your coach. I would say, John, I, I want you to grade your guys and give me a number grade for everybody. And then I'm going to show you my number grade for everybody. And then we're going to go to the group here and we'll look at all the number grades. You have to do it by number. If you do it any other way, emotion is going to take over and that's going to change the way you do things. It's a guarantee. It's human nature. It's what happens. Yeah. I would maybe give him one do not touch card, like a get out of jail free card. Okay. And just be like, John, you get to pick one player that we won't trade no matter what you say, because like you have to give him something, but beyond that, you have to let management and the analytics team do what they do and really, to your point, grade these players on a micro level across Mm -hmm. the board. And so I think that's the only way you're going to be able to figure out whether the value to the team is greater than the value in the open market. And and that's where you you kind of have to start with, with your main roster and go through everybody that doesn't have a no trade clause. And even people who do have no movement in there, figure out what it is and how you can incorporate that in, into what you're, you're trying to do. And then I think, you know, the next thing that's really important is to, is to immediately prioritize who you need to evaluate 
on the flyers and phantoms and prospects in terms of what are we using the remaining games for and put those players in those positions as best as possible to get the kind of data you need. Now I'm going to also, I agree with that. I'm also going to tell you something else that I would, if I were a Danny Berea, I'd be like, John, I, I want you to get to Lehigh Valley for one of their last games this year, or at least tell me you're going to go for the playoffs because we're going to need to discuss these players too. And I'd like to get your input because he's not going to go on his own. He hasn't gone at all. He barely talks to Ian uh, LaPerrier. That's not true. I when think is, he has gone some, I, but I haven't heard of him going. If he's been there once, that's all he's been there. He needs to be more active in that. Yeah, I, I think that'll be a big part of it that um, he should go to and some of the fly, more of the Flyers staff in, in analytics, in hockey ops. They need to get as many people as possible yes. to as many Phantoms games as possible. No question. And I think they should be, you know, I think extending their prospects scouting as well and having more communication with the scouting department in terms of people who are up for ELCs as well as further down in the system, because you want to know who you're willing to throw in the rights to as a, you know, as part of trades as well, and really look at the potential of everybody top to bottom in the system. Yeah. I mean, just to give you an idea, that things are moving slowly. And again, Danny Briere is at the GM meetings. Fine. But like Emil Andre should be signed already. And he's not. So that tells me things are not like exactly fluid right now or, or not fluid. I shouldn't say that things are not exactly running well right now, because if they were running well, like that would have been the first guy I would have been on the phone with. I would have told you know, Dave Scott, hey, listen, we're going to call him. Let's get him signed. If he wants to come over, uh, he can come over now if he wants to wait till next year. But let's get him signed so we could announce that because he's a really good player and he's one of our best prospects. And we haven't heard anything. Yeah, I think that's a part of it, too. I'm going to cut him a little bit of slack just because the the turnover was very immediate and as we said yesterday, a surprise to a lot of people. And they, they do have the GM meetings. Um, but I think it's something, it's the first thing they should do. Absolutely. It's, the I mean, first Brent should be telling should be, Danny, yeah. Hey, this should be done now. Yeah. I could do it. I, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, there, there's something to be said for why hasn't this happened yet, but at the same time, I can sort of understand uh, to some degree, but I also think that in looking at guys like Emil Andre and looking at uh, Jay O'Brien and looking at, Cutter Gautier, and then also looking at the current guys on the Phantoms. And I know we've gotten call ups for Tyson Forster um, and Elliot Denoy on an emergency basis, but we also have to plan out as much as possible some of those other call ups. I know we have three left now because of the Sam Merson call up uh, due to Carter Hart's illness, but I think that. You know, we really have to plan to use those and get some other guys up to the NHL level to see what they can do. Yeah, totally agree. Um, you know, we're going to be talking about these kinds of things a lot now for the next, you know, couple weeks. But I, I agree with that. I just, my issue right now is just because Danny's an in interim and just because he's at the GM meetings. The whole system shouldn't be shut down. That's fair. I just don't think that that's, it's part of the factor in, in the immediate of things they should be doing. I'm just saying, you know, what's the remainder of the season look like from a player evaluation standpoint and who do we need to focus on here in order to make some, some big decisions. I think while John Tortorella has made a decision on Kiefer Bellows in not so many words, the organization has to make a decision on him and whether to prioritize well, okay. him or not there. I mean, there's other guys like that. You no, know, no, 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 have... there are, but here's what happens with that though. And I've seen this happen. Uh, it happened with the Toronto Maple Leafs when uh, Lou Lamorello was there. Uh, the organization wanted to play a defenseman whose name escapes me right now. Um, oh, um, Frankie Corrado and Frankie mm -hmm. Corrado was, I think scratched for like, 50-something games because Mike Babcock just wouldn't play him. 
You don't want that to happen to Kiefer Bellows either. And Tortorella would do that. Yeah. I, you know, there, there is a problem there, but I think if John Tortorella wants to get a better team to coach, he's going to have to back down on some things and he's going to have to play ball. And I just think that that's the approach you're going to have to take. And, and I think, you know, there's some other guys and on the phantoms and on, um, you know, in the prospect pool that really are, they're going to really have to dig down and, and see what they think, because uh, like, I want to know where they think Bobby Brink is in his development. Uh-huh. They're going to have to make a decision about Samu Tuomala and whether, yep. you know, there's a future for him. They're going to have to decide if they can incorporate uh, J.R. Avon into the plan. I mean, Zade Wisdom, I think there's some question marks on and and throughout the system. And then I want to see some of the defensemen and what they can do. We've talked about Ethan Sampson, you know, coming and getting some games in. Where is Ronnie Adder? You know, I, yeah. I want to I want to see some of these things and they're going to have to strategically figure out a way to work them in in the remainder of the season, whether it's with the Flyers or with Lehigh Valley in order to help the process. Right. And remember, when I'm talking about Babcock, he's going against the wishes of Lou Lamorello. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's now it's reversed here in Philly. You know, Briere is going to have to kind of go along with the wishes of John Tortorella a lot. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have these types of situations. So, yeah, that's that's going to be a little bit of a battle. And again, while John says it's important for the AHL team to go to the playoffs, it is. And while he says it's important for those guys to get that experience, it is. But he's also not going to tell you this, but act this way that the rest of the Flyers season is more important than what happens in Lehigh to him. And it is. Well, you know, sorry, John. I mean, and I'm just saying this is what I think. I know, right? no, I know. And I understand there's a certain reality there, but we've got to like go beyond that. And I would think that he would be willing to cave on a few things because he wants a better team to coach. And this will help get him there. Well, let me know uh, when that happens. I haven't seen it well, yet. Listen, this is what needs to happen. I'm not saying it will. This is I what know. needs to happen. I agree with you that it needs to. I do agree with you. All right. Well, we've got some of your questions. Uh, of course, you know, we have a lot of questions, such as we have just laid out here about how it's going to go. Uh, but your questions are pretty good as well. We're going to get to them next. Today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar. Looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and calories? Then you got to try a Built Bar. My goal has been to eat a little healthier this year, but I don't want to compromise taste. And in order to do so, you got to try Built. With Built, healthy is actually tasty. What makes them so good? Well, for starters, they're covered in 100% real chocolate, and they come in unbelievably delicious flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and coconut almond. And what's even better is that they only have 130 calories and 4 grams of sugar, but have a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't need to wait around to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering yours at built.com. You can still do that, but you can also get them at your local Walmart or Sands Club. Head to your nearest Walmart today, walk to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can get a four bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate or coconut puffs. And if you're close to Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13 bar box with our hit flavors, brownie batter and churro. You can thank me later. All right, Russ, we've got an excellent set of questions from our listeners slash viewers. And uh, Mark had a really good question that was echoed by a bunch of others in in a couple of different ways over on YouTube. Uh, Is there anything to the Carter Hart to Detroit trade rumors? If so, what's the ideal return? Uh, I don't think there's anything to it. I think if there was, I would hear it from Kevin Allen. I do a show with him three times a week. So I haven't heard it. I They have Sebastian Cosa. They have Billy Huso. Why would they want Carter Hart? It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I, I don't think it makes sense either. And, you know, they're so good with drafting and developing in in Detroit that I think it would make more sense for them to have an in-house solution right. to the problem. Um, and, you know, they could supplement for backup reasons, 
in the open market, but um, bringing in a guy like Carter Hart to Detroit, I, that just doesn't add up to me in, in the end. Um, as far as a return, you know, I, I would think you'd need to get a first in return for him yeah. or a comparable goalie. Yeah, you would need to get a first. Um, not sure the Flyers would want to go a goalie back. You know, that's that's a whole other mm-hmm. discussion for another day. But a, a first and a prospect or another pick. That's what yeah. I'm asking for because the salary is reasonable. And, you know, he has one more RFA year, which, you know, you'll negotiate with him. And then, you know, he might hit free agency. So that's what negates the deal a little, but you still get a couple of years. And that's another reason why it doesn't make sense for Detroit because the timeline doesn't really match up. They're close to the playoffs, but um, that last RFA year, maybe when the Detroit's going to make the playoffs, maybe. And I don't think Eiserman, I, I from what I know of him, and, and again, he keeps it close to the vest, he doesn't want to spend big money on a goalie. That's the one thing. He's, yeah. He has not done that yet, so I don't think he's going to do that. Yeah, I don't think so either. Uh, he's definitely a get a goalie from within kind of guy. All right. Uh, Marty wants to know what the potential return could be for Konechny. So what are we talking? Two more years left on his deal, I think. Um, and he's like five something based on the year he had, which was a career year. You know, I think you could get, um, depending on the team, if if this is a draft trade, if it's a team that is looking to get better, it's going to be a 2024 first. It's not going to be a 23. If it's a team that's a perennial winner and it's a late first, yeah, you probably could get that. Um, but you would need a, uh, a first and another pick. I would make that other pick in this year's draft, whether it's a second or a third. And mm-hmm. if I could get a prospect in it, great. If I can't, okay. But maybe I could put a player in there to get a prospect off of your list and I'll give you one of mine. So that's that's what I'm looking at. Yeah. Part of me also thinks that obviously health is a factor here, yes. but and timing is a factor. But assuming Travis Konechny can have a season similar to the one he's had this year, I almost think he's a trade deadline guy to get maybe, you know, a a slightly better return, but uh, we'll see how how that goes. But uh, yeah, I think Konechny is definitely uh, somebody that they should consider and take, take calls on and actually actively shop. Let's be real, as opposed Mm -hmm. to just taking calls. Yeah. Um, Mario wants to know about the playoff format and says, do you think the NHL will change its playoff format anytime soon? In his opinion, too many good teams are not getting in. What about four divisions with eight teams each? Top four teams in each division make the playoffs. Uh, During the regular season, each team would play the other teams in the division at least three times. I mean, some people are going to hate this, um, but I've heard this talked about, and it's true. Every time a change is made, everybody likes it, and then three years later, everybody bitches about it. So I don't think they're going to make any changes until they have expansion. And I'm fine with it because, again, the, the the problem, and I'm not saying his idea is bad. It's not. It's a good idea. But the problem is every time you make changes, you're making them because you're perceiving that, like, Toronto doesn't have a chance because Boston and Tampa are good. Okay. But by the time you make those changes, let's say, you know, um, Columbus gets Connor Bedard, and in two years they turn into what Tampa was. Well. <laughs> You know, now you're comp- now you're going to complain that Columbus is in your division and you can't beat them. You know what I mean? It, it those things are secular, and you just have to kind of deal with it. So, but I, I like his idea, but I don't think they'll do it. Yeah, it's really hard with the expansion that has happened over the years, right? Because there used to be a higher percentage of the teams that made the playoffs because there were fewer yep. teams, right? And so that's the price you pay for expansion is that fewer teams are going to make the playoffs. In my opinion, I, I think that's. That's okay to still yeah. to have half the league make the playoffs. I think that's still pretty generous. And I know it's tough for like motivational reasons. It, there was a time there was only TV six reasons, teams. But... Only six teams didn't make it, remember? I mean, yep. So, yeah. And it was like pretty easy to make the playoffs. It was. So, um, t- just times are different and it's more competitive. And I think that's also adding an element of you know intrigue to the league on its own about building teams that can make the playoffs it's harder to do now it is 
And, and there's an appeal to that myself. Will wants to know about Tony D'Angelo. Do you think it would be possible to see the Flyers buy him out? Uh, his one year, 5 million turns into two years of 1.6 million on the cap. You know, he's weighing the dead cap space versus opening a, a slot for a player who can actually play D. But the coach likes him. You know, he, he likes his uh, aggressiveness. Yes and no. I I mean, he likes his aggressiveness over everything else. Like, I agree with you that there are other things that may not be to his liking, but he but he likes his feistiness. So I think if you gave him a choice, are you going to keep him or not? I, I think he would keep him because it's only for one more year. So and if he does get some sort of year out of him, you can trade him at the deadline for something. That's the other part of this rather than having the dead cap money. But, you know, for the most part, Torts likes him. I know he is been critical at times but he likes him more than he doesn't like him otherwise he wouldn't play him yeah i think for me i i don't like that much dead cap on on this player first off because it's only one year left on the deal right and secondly if you sort of add what a second or third pairing defenseman would cost you like I still think that cost plus the one point six is more than you want to spend. Right. So I'd rather just eat it for one more year if he has to. Stay or out. or a half a year. Yeah, yeah. If he can get traded at the deadline or something. All right. Last question. Um, Brandon had a good one about the Calder Cup playoffs and can you send waiver exempt players down or is there a deadline for that um using the example of noah cates and cam york can they go down after it's too late the they had to have yeah that was like two weeks ago i think or a week and a half ago you would have to have sent them down to get them on the clear day roster and then you could send them back up and then you know but you would have had to have done that and had them on the roster and they didn't they didn't do it remember they said even with cam york they, they weren't going to do it yep that is true. So unfortunately, uh, neither of those guys can play in the Calder Cup playoffs. All right, that will do it for today's show. We'll be back again tomorrow. And we are going to kind of dig into the front office structure and what it is now and any changes that we would make uh, if we were advising uh, Comcast and Dave Scott and whoever else in, in terms of restructuring. We're going to get into that tomorrow. Uh, as a reminder, we always want to hear from you. If you want your mailbag questions answered on the show, you can tweet us at Lockdown Flyers. You can email us at Lockdown Flyers at Gmail, or you can comment over on YouTube. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at R Miriam. That's R M I R I A M. I'm Russ at Sportsology, S-P-O-R-T-S-O-L-O-G-Y. Thanks for making Locked on Flyers your first listen today. Now make your next listen, Game to Game NHL. It's every moment, every top performance, every result. Locked on Game to Game covers every game from across the NHL with local analysis that only Locked on can deliver. It's on the Locked on NHL feed wherever you get your podcasts. Have a great day, everyone.